welcome back. This is The Verdict on Channel Television. And we welcome you back to this segment where we'll be taking a look further at some of the preparations uh, that are taking place and what the issues are at this point in time. It's late, though, but, mm. you know, we're still taking a look at some of the various issues. And uh, at this point, uh, we're joined by a new crop of panelists. Yes. Uh, from our Buja studios, we have... Uh, Legal practitioner, Mr. Nimi Walton Jack. Thank you so much for being with us. And um, Mr. Rotimio Yakomi, the Chief Press Secretary to the Chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission. And then in our studios here in Lagos, we have uh, Mr. Danlami Bashar. Uh, of course, you remember Mr. Bashar, the interim chairman of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons uh, with Disabilities. Welcome to you all, gentlemen. Uh, Getting it on the road, let me start with you, Mr. Oyekomi. The preparations for this election, um, the preparations for this election, what can you tell us about it even at this late stage? Uh, Ijama reported earlier that we were told in the earlier part of the day that some of the areas were still reporting that they were expecting some materials. What's the update on that? Uh. Thank you very much for having me and a very good evening to all the viewers. Um, we are good to go. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a scale of 10, we are, we are 9 over 10. And I'm sure that uh, by this night, by 12 midnight, uh, all the few other areas where we have some little shortages, uh, we receive all the materials. Uh, we are watching the events. Uh, you know, we learned uh, a very big lesson from the uh, challenges we faced with the presidential and national assembly elections and we have gone very far in correcting all those mistakes um, much of the materials are in place now you know the elections we are going to be conducting this weekend are more in terms of the constituencies than the ones uh, we conducted last week uh, i have no doubt in my mind that uh, the polling units will open at eight o'clock in the morning as planned i hope uh, no astonish set fire to uh, any of our offices before tomorrow morning uh, or burn our voting uh, polling units. And I think that uh, by the grace of God, uh, things will turn out well tomorrow. Mr. Yokomi, I, I catch what you say in your, in your last uh, speech, band, or shall I say sentence, because I remember the last time we spoke to you, you had said that a lot of the, the challenges that we had for the last um, set of elections were not really to do with INEC, even though there were one or two logistic <coughs> issues. It was more to do with um, sabotage and, you know, disruptions. What are you doing differently this time as the Commission to ensure that, you know, you have some parts of security locked down? What are you doing differently for tomorrow? Well, uh, incidentally, uh, we had a meeting, a very fruitful meeting, uh, with the Inspector General of Police yesterday and all the security agencies involved in election security. And we had very useful discussions. And uh, at the meeting, we discussed all aspects. Uh, the police came with the report. We, we compared notes with what happened uh, last week, I mean, on, on February the 23rd and suggestions were made on how to move forward. And those things, uh, the, the mistakes that were made uh, in the, the last time have been largely corrected because the loopholes that we found uh, have been blocked. And I think that uh, what was experienced last time will not be experienced this time. I, I'm, I'm confident, pretty confident that uh, we, we are, we're going to have a good experience uh, tomorrow. Mr. Yukami, if you mind coming here. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yukami, when you say some of the loopholes that were experienced in the last election um, would not occur again, I want to ask, indeed, again, as Ijeoma asked, what would be done differently? Give you a case in point. Um, again, we use the Okota situation, which is not a very pleasant experience to continue to use as an example, where a policeman is seen chasing five <laughs> thugs around. What would be done differently in that kind of situation? Well, the, the, the materials uh, that are supposed to be where they should be are where they are. That's what I mean. And there was a slowdown the last time, but that is not happening now. Except, of course, you know, uh, sometimes things can happen. Uh, you, could be, you could have a situation where uh, some of 
our doctor may be involved in some mishap, maybe an accident or something like that, and then we will have to quickly mobilize again. Uh, except that happens, there is, there is no other issue. But the plant already in place in terms of deploying materials and making sure that all the smart card readers, the personnel, the voting cubicles, the ballot boxes are in place, that one, uh, the sensitive materials, all the, those ones have been taken care of. From my own point of view, from what I know, I don't think that we're going to have any serious issues at tomorrow. Provided, of course, like I said, pray that we don't have the fifth columnist to disrupt our plans overnight. Now, uh, I guess maybe the key, the key question to ask with relation to this, the Okota example and others, is that is there going to be a change to the policy that security agents within the vicinity, the immediate vicinity of the polling unit will be allowed to bear arms? Um, I don't think so. I don't think uh, they will be armed. You know, like I said, uh, uh, sorry, I'm still to be having some problem with this. Um, th there are three rings in terms of election security. The first ring is around the polling unit, where you have the unarmed security men, uh, the police officer, and the sister agencies, maybe a civil defense. Then the second ring uh, comprises the uh, patrol teams that are armed. Uh, they are nearby and they can be called in if there's a serious situation. And then we have the final ring, which is the military. They stay on the outskirts, and they can, they can be called in if the situation becomes very, very critical. Uh, I think that, is, that will still be the uh, method that will be adopted tomorrow. But of course, with some lessons learned, I think that the patrol teams will be uh, uh, willing to move in faster now. And I think more will be deployed, especially in areas where uh, they are likely to be incident. And you know, the security, the police that is the lead agency uh, has all the uh, security architecture of this country. They know exactly where the, bla the black spots are. And they've told us that they've taken care uh, of all these areas. So I don't really emphasize any serious problems tomorrow that could disrupt the election substantially. Mr. Yekomi, you've talked about the three rings. One wonders what happened to those three rings in Rivers and Lagos when we saw the pictures that we saw. But do you not think that most of the visuals that we saw were happening right there, you know, as voting was happening, you know, in that inner circle where nobody was armed? So perhaps that's why Lad is asking the question, in the spirit of learning lessons from the last election, should, should that not be considered? That's right. Uh, in the last election, I'm happy to report that the, the police have arrested quite a number of people who were responsible for the disruptions the last time. And I think that um, there are some things you cannot say on air. Some other proactive measures have been taken. The truth of the matter is, you know, if you, if you have policemen around the polling unit armed, uh, we don't want to have a situation where we'll have accidental discharge or some mishap that could, you know, cause chaos. Because if you cause chaos at the polling unit, then it will disrupt the voting process. I think those who made that arrangement know exactly why they did that. But learning from the other experience, from what was discussed yesterday uh, with the Inspector General Police and the other sister agencies, uh, some good, new good proactive measures have been put in place. Uh, that, that's my, my, my own uh, uh, statement I can make here, that um, voters should expect some form of greater security tomorrow, better than what they experienced uh, about two weeks ago. Mr. Wilson Jack, in your opinion, what would you say tomorrow would look like? Would you, do you think INEC has drawn the lessons as uh, Mr. Yukomi has said, INEC has drawn lessons and tomorrow they'll be better prepared and the electorate can come out in all confidence that it will be a smooth process? Yeah, well, I think as a citizen uh, watching from the sidelines, uh, it's obvious that INEC is a uh, I would say better prepared than in the presidential election. Uh, for example, late arrival of material in a capital city uh, like Port Harcourt, just a few kilometers away from the local government INEC office. Uh, such things once one believes should not occur again, and I'm sure that has been taken into uh, consideration. Security-wise, uh, where I voted in the last election, all went well, uh, as uh, explained. The the police 
officials on duty were not armed. They were there, the polling units. The outer rings were manned by patrol teams and by stationary armed uh, military personnel. So the, we had no problem in my own area, and I want to believe that uh, they can only improve on that. Uh, we are more concerned with the areas that uh, violence was witnessed, and in some of those areas, election did not even take place. Uh, I guess the disagreement to, you know, over material, either material distribution or attempt to prevent hijack of materials led to violence in certain areas. We want to believe that now that we've all learned a lesson, uh, those areas we vote this time around, and that voting will go peacefully. Can we, can, can we correctly infer that you are a lot more optimistic this time uh, about things like voter turnout, that the voter turnout will be better this time if all these other things, the logistics are there, uh, the confidence is there, and so on? Yes, yeah, we expect from experience, we expect a higher voter turnout because the elections here are more local, more personal. Uh, the candidates are better known to the voters. Uh, but uh, in addition to the problem, the challenges we are going to face now is uh, perhaps the electoral authority, uh, management body, the INEC, has to actually make a statement to assure voters that presence of military personnel is actually for their protection so that they can feel confident to come out and vote. Uh, otherwise, the uh, news is already making the rounds, particularly on the social media, about you know, the military presence being something that is meant to favor either one side or the other, which some of us who have been involved in elections know that when the military are out on the street, they're actually supposed uh, to be protecting, providing overall security coverage for the average voter. Mr. Donlami, Mr. Bashar, that is, let me bring it to you. I remember we had you in the studio when we were talking about vulnerable groups, and uh, we talked about what INEC was going to do. Now, I'm not going to go into that. Just tell us what your experience was voting on February 23rd as, as, as one in the, the vulnerable group. Yeah, um, well, I went to vote in my um, voting center, which was uh, not too far from me. Um, we had been told that um, blind persons would be given the Braille ballot guide. That was not available. Um, we were told that um, persons with disabilities would have access to the EC40 form or something like that. That was not uh, made available. And of course, um, the uh, polling uh, center was inaccessible. To me, as a blind person, it was not access because I had to climb some stairs to get to the uh, polling booth, and I thought that was not really acceptable. I mean, had I been uh, someone in a wheelchair, I wouldn't really have been able to get to the uh, um, polling um, booth. In fact, uh, there were one or two people whom the uh, electoral official had to come down to meet because this center was inaccessible. And um, I think that really stems from what I continue to say, the registration, um, the, the initial registration. Because if the registration form had captured the fact that uh, a person with disability is coming to this center, and uh, INEC had also known the type of disability, if that, there's a database of that nature then INEC will be able to know exactly who to deploy to that particular area, where to send their various materials to. So those materials that we expected as blind persons, we never had them. So what did you do? How did you vote in the end? Did you have, what, who helped you? Well, the electoral idea says I could go with a person of my choice to vote, and I went with my wife, and actually there was another uh, person I went with, um, a sign language interpreter. Um, the chairman, actually, of the African Sign Language Interpreters was with me because we wanted to find out whether anything was being provided for deaf persons, but there's really nothing much for them. And I'm, I was, I'm still wondering whether the provision was actually made for uh, persons with uh, albinism, magnifying glasses, and so on. So I think maybe INEC you know, still has to do quite a bit. Um, I don't think the training for the uh, ad hoc staff was uh, adequate, and I'm not sure if the information given to them was actually adequate enough. But, um, we, well, I'm sure it's th these are things that uh, INEC will be able to correct going forward.
Have you reached out? Have you reached out to INEC in the in the aftermath of your experience during this first election on the 23rd of February? Well, I actually sent my text messages round, and one of them was to the director of voter education, and um, of course he said he saw the um, the text message and. Uh, obviously would uh, be interested in doing something about it. So I, 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 I believe that INEC would actually take that issue very seriously. Was it just for you here in, I mean, I'm assuming you voted here in Lagos, is that so? Yeah, I Was that the same for, or yeah, for I, any other people? Yes, I voted in Lagos, but quite a number of uh, blind people have actually told me the same experience. They didn't get the uh, Braille Ballot Guide and the EC40 form was not available to them. And of course, they also talked of uh, inaccessibility. I was going to actually throw it to Mr. Yekomi, since we have you there in yes, Abuja. Actually, I believe you are listening to, um, to, to what he has accounted. You know, and I remember there was a very big advert about how this Braille guy should be used and all that. We saw that side of the virtual education. And you hear him talking about himself and, and others like himself not having access to it. Yes, I can, and it's really very sad. I feel uh, very bad that that happened. Uh, I guess uh, there was some uh, collection of data uh, about uh, uh, gentlemen and, and women in, in, in this category so that we can serve them better. And we've actually had meetings uh, before now, a series of meetings with people uh, with special needs uh, in order to be able to uh, provide uh, this sort of assistance to them. And, you know, one of the things we did, for instance, for Nigerians uh, living with albinism, uh, starting from Anambra governorship election, we provided magnifying glasses for them to be able to, to read uh, the signs and, and the things because they told us that the sun affects them uh, during, during the day when they want to cast their ballot. And I think there was some arrangement for uh, people with visual impairment for them to have this braille and these things were procured and supplied. And I honestly cannot say exactly what went wrong in that particular area, because in some other areas, uh, these supplies were made and, uh, and, and people had access to them. But we then need to interrogate what happened in the gentleman's area, for which I feel very sad and I apologize on behalf of the commission. Mr. Ekomi, the, the, the people living with physical challenges, um, they have an association and they tend to find a way of communicating with themselves. For instance, if you hear Mr. Bashir, he talked about how a text message, he sent out a text message to his people, and hopefully one of the text messages got to an INEC official. So let's ask, what's the plan for tomorrow so that this kind of um, testimony will not be heard again? No, actually, at every polling unit or every voting point, it's a standard procedure. Um, when you see uh, somebody uh, needing a special uh, services or uh, somebody who is not able to, to walk or somebody on wheelchair, whatever the case might be, they are taken straight to uh, the front of the queue and offered assistance. The same goes for the elderly. Uh, the same goes for the visibly pregnant uh, women. And, and, and of course, um, when, they, when, when they come like that, it's even, you know, the voters themselves understand why these things are because we've done some uh, voter education uh, narratives that we put out there to, to Nigerians to please show some empathy. And you find that when they see elderly people, uh, voters are even the ones that will assist the elderly man or woman to the front or somebody on wheelchair. So it's, it's given that that is, uh, and of course, uh, with what this gentleman has said, I think between now and tomorrow, we'll communicate to the respective uh, states and then, you know, get uh, some things that are not right, right, you know, communicate and ensure that by the time uh, voters or this uh, set of people get to the polling units tomorrow, they, they have a smooth experience. So yeah, come here. I know we need to go on a break quickly, but this is something for you to actually think about before we come back. Mr. Bashari was talking about a database for those who are you know, physically challenged in one way or the other. Does INEC know the number of physically challenged people um, that they have and um, how many of them are posted to you know, polling units around the country? Because he is saying that that would help. So just to know from you whether there's any idea of the number um, of physically challenged people and what the plan for them is, polling unit to polling units. 
Indeed, uh, but that, that what you think about that, and maybe while we're away on break, if you don't have the exact figures, you might, you might be able to make one or two calls uh, <laughs> to, to get those details. But, and of course, if there is the opportunity, you also uh, allay Mr. Bashar's uh, fears against tomorrow that um, he might be able to get his Braille guide. After all, he is voting in Lagos, but that's after this break. Yeah.